Babe Ruth was on all the good stuff. You're on. Boom! Hey! We got a lot. We can let them kind of know what you guys are. Yeah. Alright, so we just. Load it. Look at all these people! Yo's face join! To the Yost. Boom. But yeah, you know, that's the funny story. I'll tell you guys this funny story I heard one time. That Babe Ruth's infamous shot, where he called his shot, and he pointed, he was leaning on his, um, his bat. They actually said that he was so drunk that day <laughs> that he was about to pass out or throw up, so he was leaning on his bat, and he was trying to block the sun with his hand, and that from the perspective that they took, it looked like he was calling his shot. <laughs> wow. High level athletics, at its finest. I was told that he pointed all the time. Oh, did he? Like every every at bat, he would. This <laughs> is like I'm going yard. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you miss a uh, hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Wayne Gretzky. Yeah. So you call it one time and that's great. Are you guys doing? Yeah, it's live. Are you guys? You're good. We got like ten minutes. Oh no, it's okay. Actually, no. Do you want to come be on TV? Feel something weird. Do you just feel TV? You look swole in the background. We're actually talking about you this whole podcast too. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> oh, it's not really okay. We can just hear it. We got eight now. Marty, 3715. Look at that. We didn't have this before when they would show up, huh? Did we not have when people would talk? I know that you can write something. Jenna, write something! Yoast. I think that's her. Yeah, well, I mean, how many people are named? Hey! hey! Perfect. Dude, Jay Cutler. I don't think that's the real Jay Cutler. <laughs> Aaron Tyler Gardner. Hey, buddy! You see it, baby, ATG. Word up. Thank you, one minute. Gardner's like at work hanging out right now. Mm. He, uh, he told me today that um, he's working. Gardner, where are or you? He's in charge. He's in charge. So that's Are you running the country right now? Teresa. We're actually getting some following. Look at that. Yeah, we're crushing it right now. I'm really excited for this. Thanks, guys, for turning in on my way home. Nice. Nice. Hey, bro. All right, dude, I think you're up. All right. Jump in here. Welcome again, guys, to another episode of San Diego Athletics Live. My name is Justin Fields, and today I am joined with James. Say wait. Brownheim? Brownheim? <laughs> Branham. 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 That was close. Um, right. He is a performance consultant, but here, here at San Diego Athletics, he is our sports psych. He's been working with me for the last couple of months, um, how much of a back, basket case that I am. Um, but would you tell our audience at home just kind of like a little bit of a Cliff Notes version of what exactly that you do? So, uh, just recently graduated from John F. Kennedy University uh, with a master's in sports psychology. Um, so focusing on what's going on between the years uh, in different performance domains, uh, sports, work, life, and school. Uh, so it's really trying to focus on, you know, how we're thinking and what kind of behaviors come from that. Very cool. So uh, a lot of what you are focusing on is working with athletes. Now specifically, is it high level athletes that you're looking to focus with? Or, I mean, I'm definitely not a, I'm a semi-professional exerciser, so I'm used to be an athlete, but what is the scope as far as your practice goes? Like, who are you looking to help when it comes to athletics? Well, in my profession, I mean, everybody says that they want to work with professional athletes, um, if that's narcissistic or based off ego. Uh, to me, it's just working with anybody that wants to get better. So I, I don't really look at the level of the athlete as much as what is their goal and how far away they are from that. So, I mean, I think sports psychology is something that's relatively new. You mentioned this earlier. When was the big kind of shift to start working with the whole mental aspect of athletics? So the first technical sports psychologist was in 1938, and that was a guy that worked with the Chicago Cubs. Um, but the first professional sports psychologist wasn't until the 1984 Olympics here in the U.S. Um, there was other countries that had versions of sports psychologists, but here in the U.S. that's when it became a profession um, with the L.A. Olympics. And how, how big is it now, like as far as like professional sports? Um, how many teams, I mean just kind of get us an overview, like employ some type of sports psychologist or therapist? Yeah, so traditionally sports psychology was more of a therapy point of view, it was more rehab. You know, you dealt with things that were going wrong, um, you didn't really look at how to get better. 
So now it's shifted from this rehab point of view to performance enhancement point of view. And in 1992, that's when the first, um, it's called ASP, Association of Applied Sports Psychology. That's when they started doing their first uh, certifications for sports psychology. At the time, you had to have a doctorate in psychology, clinical work to be able to address you know, mental health. Um, recently, I was told that ASP has about 1,700 uh, certified consultants wow, around cool. the world. Yeah. So it's not really that many. I mean, you're looking at the profession as maybe 20, 25 years old. And we will have to address that in the next few years. We will have to call him Dr. James because he is getting his doctorate in sports psychology. So um, we should touch upon the fact that this is not just limited to high level athletes, right? Like this type of sports psychology and this type of mental preparation when it comes to our fitness can be for the everyday gym goer, am I correct? Yeah, so sports psychology is where these kind of strategies came from. Uh, research really focused on uh, motor learning at first and then started going into more of how people were talking to themselves, kind of taking from sports science and from psychology. Okay. So sports psychology bridges those two gaps. Um, so anybody who thinks and performs really would, this would be applicable to. So as far as just everyday general strategies for all of us, what are things that we can employ in our fitness, in our training, in our everyday life that will help us get to a perpetual next level, as you would say? Yeah, so Trevor Moad, he is uh, one of the more prominent sports psychologists um, or sports psychology consultants in the industry. He works with Russell Wilson personally. So his thing is it's sports psychology or mental skills, mental strength, whatever you want to call it, is about continuous improvement. So the idea is that first off, you have to have an intention. You have to know what that intention is. So you would start with some type of goal setting. Right, we've talked about this before. Right? Yeah, so traditionally goal setting has been long-term, short-term, just more of a time base. Um, but now what they're trying to do through sports psychology, sports psychology strategies is going into what they call outcome goals, performance goals, and process goals. So let's break that down a little bit. Like what's the difference between those long-term goals, those short-term goals, those outcome goals? And how does that play into your day-to-day -day, um, experience within the gym or whatever type of fitness aspect? Yeah, so your outcome goal would be considered kind of like your long-term goal. So um, Making the CrossFit Games. Yeah, so, it, so making the CrossFit Games. That would be an outcome long-term goal. Right. So performance goal would be, first off, you have to get through the Opens, and then you have to get through Regionals. So those would be, you can consider those as outcome goals, but really you have to perform getting the top three uh, or five of those events to be able to move on to the next level. Um, so you have your outcome goal, getting to the games, your performance goals, getting through these two qualifiers, and then your process goals would be, what are your training programs, what are your you know, limitations, what are your strengths, what do you need to work on? So as from a professional standpoint, would you suggest, I mean, is it beneficial for these athletes or potential athletes to write these type of goals down? Do we start with a big goal and then we branch down to smaller goals? Or do we just kind of throw it out in the wind and just see what sticks? Yeah, so there's no research that's actually behind it, but there's always been that saying, if you write down something, you're 70, 80% more likely to achieve it. Um, I haven't seen any research behind that, but you know, if, if we write down our goals, we're providing intention to that. And so by providing intention, you're actually strengthening your focus even more. So with the outcome, the performance, and the process goals, your outcome goal, you know, you really seem to write that down one time every six, 12 months. Um, and then you're always reevaluating those process goals and performance goals. Um, so if you don't really have a focus or what a goal, you know, a goal, you really don't know what those process goals or performance goals might be. Um, so you're always constantly reevaluating re the process and the performance goals. You know, we talked about Brian Anders uh, in a previous episode. So if you guys haven't had a check, chance to check that out, episode four, San Diego Athletics Live, we talked about a book that we're doing on our Pro Book Club, and that is The Mindset, The New Psychology for Success. And this is actually what kind of motivated you to get into sports psychology, am I correct? Yeah, so I listened to uh, Mark Verstegen. He's the founder of <coughs> Athletes Performance, um, Exos, out in Arizona. And so I listened to him talk about one of their pillars of their program, which is mindset. And so he said that this book was part of the motivation of addressing that psychological component of the training. And so listening to him talk about it and then reading the book, it's, I was like, there's nothing else for me except sports psychology. You know, and we, we probably came at it from a very, uh, 
basic standpoint, but would you mind kind of just going over once again and probably expanding upon the different types of mindset with a fixed mindset and a growth mindset and the difference between the two and how they benefit or hinder athletes coming into a gym? Yeah, so uh, the book Mindset. Um, she Man, we're talks giving these about, guys so much peak <laughs> on, right? It's um, awesome. So she talks about fixed mindset and growth mindset. And um, what a lot of psychology and neuropsychology is breaking down, uh, these strategies uh, within the industry are looking at focus and looking at stress. And so looking at where are you focusing, what are you thinking about, and the stress being how do you deal with setbacks. So what she talks about in the book of the fixed mindset and growth mindset is really looking at challenges and how you react to those challenges. So she gives different examples of you know youth, school, work, sports, where people are given a challenge and either they love that challenge and they wanted to do better or they want to try something harder no matter how well they scored, or there's people where you know they started feeling a little bit weaker, a little bit less smart, and so they wanted something that was easier for them to address their own ego that they're going through that process. Now, is having one mindset more beneficial for an athlete than another? I mean, of course. If a growth mindset is someone who's gonna keep stressing their system to get, keep improving. So you had kind of talked about, does someone need to fail to grow? Right. Um, in sports psychology, we look at it, does someone need to go through a stressful situation to see what they're made of? So if someone doesn't push their limits, they will never know what their limits are. Um, so, you know, kind of looking at a failure success, you know, it just depends on the vocabulary that someone's using. And we talked about earlier today, and I brought up this question, we had a little uh, meeting as far as our coaches go, um, and the gray area that it seems within the book, um, it's very black and white, the two types of mindsets. Um, but there's a lot of gray that I think like, are interchangeable between the two. And I feel like a good example of that would be, we were just talking about before we started the interview, is Tom Brady. You know, this guy was taken in, the seventh round, and he can still name every single quarterback that was taken for him yeah. after winning three championships, winning two multiple. So, I mean, to my point, and what I took from the mindset book is that that seems somewhat of a fixed mindset, correct? But it's benefiting him as well. So, I think fixed mindset and growth mindset, it's not necessarily fixed aided. You're not fixated on a you know one thing. Um, you know. In previous discussions, we kind of had talks about like, you know, having a chip on your shoulder, right? right? You know, is that necessary to be able to perform at a high level? You know, having that drive, that might not be something that someone else has or a situation they've gone through. So in like Tom Brady's case, we were talking about how his passing book has like 30 plays and Peyton Manning's has variation of like a thousand or something like that. Like that's what I've been, that's what I've been told. So, I mean, you could look at that I think maybe Peyton Manning is more of a fixed mindset. I mean, he is constantly looking for challenges, but he's stuck in this thing where, you know, he has to be so analytical. Um, but is that, you know, is that helping him to become a Super Bowl quarterback versus just a really great NFL quarterback? So um, I think that Tom Brady, you know, I don't really know a lot about him and I haven't met him or had a, a chance to talk to him, but- yeah, we think that all the time. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, but we don't believe that. Um, so, but, I mean, you look at success. I mean, he has, I think at that level, you can't have a fixed mindset to be an NFL athlete um, and to be competing that much. Um, but is there situations where people have fixed mindsets, even though they might have growth mindset in the NFL, they might have a fixed mindset in another area? Right. Um, that's what we talked about is that gray area. Um, you know, it really is breaking it down to challenges and how we react to those challenges. So there's so many situations we go through that are outside of those, those challenges. So I think it's within this environment, it's really looking at the training program, you know, the intentions, how they're going through that process. Um, you know, that's going to give them more about the kind of way that they're looking at that program or not. Yeah, something to move away from the, the mindset point. Something that we talked about a lot when we were meeting was the, the visualization aspect of performance. Can you touch upon that and the benefits of that from an athletic standpoint? Yeah, so visualization is, uh, it's basically seeing yourself do the movement or seeing yourself do an activity or a sport um, without actually doing it. So part of the process is closing your eyes and using the part of your brain that watches someone else do an activity um, while imagining yourself doing that activity. So your brain doesn't know the difference between watching someone and you closing your eyes and doing it. So in a way, you're strengthening that portion of your nervous system 
by going through that visualization component. And you talked about with me uh, not only visualizing and picturing the task-oriented thing that you might be doing, but then incorporating three points to that. Can you reflect upon that? You know what I'm talking about? And then performing the task, visualizing, and, and then the self-reflection part of it? Oh, okay, yeah. So, you know, when you're going through a visualization process, you're, you're getting down those technical steps. So those technical steps, you know exactly what you need to do to com uh, complete that movement. Then the next part of that is adding, this, adding the sensory components. So you're adding what should your body feel like, what does it smell like, what does it sound like. So you're adding all those environmental components. Um, so once you develop that script, you go through it. Um, but the idea is... Elaborate on the script. What do you mean exactly about it? Because we've talked about this numerous yeah. times. So you develop a script that you say to yourself, you record it, you listen to it. While you're listening to it, that's when you're closing your eyes and you're trying to see yourself complete that movement. Um, so, you know, we had worked on the, the snatch, right? So, you know, you're, you're going through the process of talking yourself through those steps, talking yourself through the sensory components so that it becomes ingrained. So that when you go up to do that lift, you're not even thinking about it, but your brain already knows what it feels like, what it, you know, what you should be doing, um, and all the sensory components. And having those couple cues, right, is important to almost simplify the movement so that when you go into just the action of that muscle memory just takes over, correct? Yeah, so you know, we had talked about like with the snatch, you know, there's so many steps to getting set, to going through the poles, to getting the bar overhead. So you don't necessarily need to think about all the steps, you just need to think about, like you said, the keywords, the one, two, or three things that's gonna help you do the whole movement in the way that you need to, to get that weight over your head. <laughs> now how important for high level athletes or even the everyday gym door, um, is it for self-reflection? coming into a gym and whether it was on a daily basis or weekly basis or a monthly basis to help us reach those goals. Yeah, so self-reflection is one of the biggest parts of sports psychology um, and especially in any you know performance domain is what they refer to it as. Um, by reflecting, the majority of the time people only reflect when something goes wrong, not when something goes right. So we want to reinforce those things that are working, not necessarily just always focus on what's not working. Because um, you know things that we had talked about in most situations, people only focus on the things that they're not getting, not on the things that they want to get. Um, so that's where reflection is one, probably one of the most important things to be doing while going through any kind of mental skills training. And to elaborate on that, we talked about uh, having a positive mindset, right? Not reflecting or focusing on whether it's in the moment the negative. Because how can that be detrimental to an athlete? Well, like we had talked about with the uh, USOC, they have these 10 guidelines, and one of their guidelines is consistency of thinking equals consistency of behavior. So the way you think creates the behavior that ultimately comes from your thinking. So if we have negative thoughts or we're thinking about, you know, we'll, we'll use like a, uh, if you're trying to think about a lift, so if you're trying to do a jerk overhead and you're only thinking about how heavy it is, how tired you are, how you maybe missed the first one or two attempts, your body's only gonna think about that. It's gonna keep thinking about the negative, keep trying to do the negative, and not necessarily get that way overhead the way that you want to. Real quickly too, guys, if you guys have any questions, just go ahead and shoot those across the screen, please. Um, one of the last things I would like to touch upon are, what do you think, because you've come in, you've seen us coach, you've seen our athletes, uh, any specific things that you can see athletes doing or implementing in their training or everyday gym life that is detrimental to them on a daily basis? Um, from a mental side, um, I would say it would, it would come down to the reflection. So, you know, like you were talking about, um, is reflecting on the workouts. You know, what's working, what's not working, is there an exercise that's more challenging or not challenging? Um, do they enjoy an exercise more than the other? Um, by reflecting on the workouts, you get a better idea of how to be able to improve. So if there's a certain exercise that's more challenging than others, that's going to affect the way that your mentality when you come into the gym. So you want to be able to always have that, you know, mindful thinking, like you were talking about being present, non-judgmental, non-negative thinking. Um, and so that's kind of the thing is that you want to come into this environment completely clear of mind, empty mind, um, but ready to learn because this is a learning environment. Now, do you think ego is a, a good thing or a bad thing when it comes to athletics? So within sports psychology, uh, under motivation and goal setting, there's a theory called goal orientation. And so what that is looking at is the difference between ego orientation and task orientation. So what is the intention of 
we'll say the exercise program. Right. You know, the individual coming in, are they just trying to lift as much weight as possible to be able to tell all their buddies? Or are they trying to get better at that lift because ultimately if they work on that task, and they work on that process, they can lift more and more later on, uh, as well as protecting against injuries. So, you know, one of those things is that through the, psych, you know, through the research is that they always say you need a little bit of ego. That ego pushes the effort, you know, helps the motivation, but if you have too high ego, it, there could be a drop in confidence very quickly. Whereas if we're you know, high on that task orientation, um, the confidence is gonna always be high because you're always focused on the process and not necessarily just the outcome. Yeah, I actually remember reading an article back in the day that um, being somewhat vain is a good thing for you. That you know, it helps you present yourself in a more positive outlook, helps you stay in shape, and it's more beneficial than just like that kind of quasi fair attitude. Um, last thing I want to touch on before we get out of here, um, when working with a team, what type of dynamics from a psych point of view do you think are most important for those athletes trying to bond together to, to get to an ultimate goal? Because I know we have a lot of really high level athletes here in our gym and our ultimate goal next year, so this is a little bit of a personal question, would be to try to get to the games. So from a day one standpoint, where do you think we should start and then progressing forward? I know that's kind of a general question, so yeah, will break it down more than that. So, you know, with working with a team, you know, one of the most important things is communication and relationship building. Um, Michael Gervais, he is probably one of the more uh, widely known uh, sports psychologists right now. He is the sports psychologist for the Seahawks. He's been working with them for the last three yeah, seasons. Um, yeah, so the first two seasons, he started working with them. They went to a Super Bowl each time and won. It's a good resume right there. Yeah, yeah so he's also uh, the head uh, sports psychologist for Red Bull North America. So he obviously has a very uh, wide <laughs> and deep uh, resume. But his biggest thing, the things that he talked about um, in different interviews that he did uh, while working with the Seahawks is he talked about is he, what he did is he discovered everybody's intention for playing football as well as the meaning behind that intention. So what he wanted to do was he wanted to know why they wanted to play football. Why was it important to them? Why were they going out on the field? Like you said, hitting grown men every single day, right. um, knocking into each other because it's not easy. It's not you know it's not something that everybody is able to handle, and, and injuries are are an issue as well. So what he tried to do was connect the leadership to the athletes as well. That it wasn't just about the coaches telling the athletes what to do. It was about connecting their goals to the feedback they were getting. So you know, working within a team, one of the most important things is what is everybody's values or what is everybody's intentions for being in that program. So it might be different, but you're all working towards that same outcome, but it's good because it helps with the communication between each other. So that communication, it's something you touched upon and we actually talked about it earlier and I'm so glad you brought it back up, is that why, right? And that not only could be for the high level athletes in our team, but for an everyday gym goer. How important is that why? And being aware of why you're coming into the gym, why you're beating yourself up, why you're trying to lose that 20 pounds. The why drives all the decision making. Um, you know, the why is the meaning behind, like you said, coming through the doors, putting on the shoes, lifting the weight overhead, going through all those challenging, you know, stressful environment um, that you're going through in here, it helps to drive all the decision making. So, you know, something like we had bringing up a lot of the weight loss, that being a goal for someone, you know, why, why do they want to lose weight? Is it just for summer? Is it just to be able to look good? You know, and that's something that Brian talked about in the previous podcast about intrinsic versus extrinsic goals. Right. Extrinsic goals, what they find through research, it's okay to start with that for the first couple of weeks, but long term, it's not going to keep driving those decisions very easily. It's going to become harder and harder the more that they try to dig themselves into into those extrinsic goals. So intrinsically, you know, it's, there is technically no wrong goal, but the reason behind the goal is what's going to keep driving that training program or that nutrition program or mental program. So all athletes should really take kind of like a little retrospective view of themselves and try to figure that out. Yeah, and that's something that we had talked about with what's called a performance profile. So it's basically writing down, you know, your top 10 things that you think you need to be the athlete or the individual or the businessman or the, you know, the, the um, parent, whatever it is. Um, so you write down those 10 things and then you, you write down a rating. And so that rating is not necessarily to show how you're you know, good or bad, but right. to show your perception of your skills that you want to be better at. 
So by having that performance profile, you can then reevaluate yourself as time goes on. So if you're working closer, you know, you feel that you're getting closer to your goal, then you can set new goals. Um, the idea with the goal setting, uh, it links up with that performance profiling. The performance profile helps to focus those goals and then ultimately focus that plan later on. That's awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, James. Anybody, yeah. last questions, throw those things up there. Um, real quickly, way our viewers can get a hold of you. If they have questions or they want to possibly set up an appointment to talk to you. Yeah, so uh, my website's going up uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, it's JL. E R A N H A M dot com, um, or you can email me at consulting at jlbranham dot com as well. Fantastic. Thank you yeah. so much, James. Appreciate Thank it, buddy. All right, guys, join us again next week. We'll dive into some more fantastic stuff here at San Diego Athletics Live.